I just want to bring the hope out and it's the hope that's going to get us through. It's that hope that's going to equalize us. It's the, we're, we're, we're all human. We're all doing the same thing. Through that hope, there's awareness and there's understanding and then prejudices just disappear. It is party season. It is a busy time for caterers Those and events. Events are back with a vengeance. We are talking to somebody who is extremely experienced and altogether fabulous in this area. Sava Savas is from Plated in Sydney. Sava, welcome to Dirty Linen. Oh, Danny. You know, it's normally me doing the beautiful intros and um, now I know what it's like to be the recipient of. Thank you. I'm kind of feeling a little bit small and humbled. Thank you. Uh, Well, we have backstory, so I'm going to start there. Um, I reckon it's 20 years ago, you probably have a better sense of timing, but I reckon it was 20 years ago, I was a little scout for Lonely Planet, the travel publisher that I worked for, who was developing a TV concept. I was zooming around Sydney, meeting interesting people, doing wonderful things, and you were one of my victims. Well, I think, (laughs) well, when I think back on it, it's literally 20 years to the to the week, I would say. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, literally. So you, first of all, who, how did you find me? I can't remember. Some, who? I don't know. Did I search? No, there was no search. Um, I, it was a referral. I don't know. It was just, I, I think you, what the, the idea of the show, it was six degrees. So it was like a journey through Sydney, meeting people who were doing really different things. So I spoke to like a cabaret performer. Um, I spoke, I, we, I visited um, Reg Mombasa, who was doing doing, you know, art and mambo and all, all that. And it was like, we need a, we need to do some Sydney fabulous. We need to do some Sydney food. And I can't remember how I came upon you, but I remember you were catering a party at a really extraordinary house. You're probably, I mean, you must be in and out of these houses all the time. But for me, I, it was a, like cliff top. You go in and you go down and down and down and down. There were views. Everything was white. There was, yeah, I, I just had this overall impression of like extraordinary and, yeah. Um, okay, so I will. I kind of recollecting back on it. I do. I actually remember it very vividly. I was. It was an engagement party. Um, right on on the, on the north side in Middle Harbour Way, and you, we had to get permission from you. First of all, it was in August, and you needed to do a pilot on me to see if I was worthy or like camera ready for this particular segment and so I had to the biggest thing we were doing was an engagement party for 200 people somewhere on the north side on the water there and then you came along with your little cameraman this little thing on his shoulder and do you remember we unloaded the van and you were sort of following it because we couldn't go into the house you we couldn't get the van up the steep driveway so you and the cameraman and I and a couple of waiters had to sit in the back of the van as it went up the hill to gain some traction to get out of there and that's my memory and I remember looking across at your face and you were just like white thinking what what am I doing who are these people get me out of get me out of here now and so after we got the van out you were like okay bye See ya. I was like, okay. So then we had to go downstairs and, and, and do the event. But track forward to November when the actual um, shooting for this particular thing show, it was, the, yes, it was six degrees. I, <laughs> I, um, I developed a Bell's palsy. Do you remember this? Oh, my God. I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And half my face had slid off. So literally like a couple of days before the filming, I, um, I got the Bell's palsy and I we had to rearrange all the filming um, to be done in the morning with the – what was the guy's name, the host? I don't know because I wasn't oh, yeah. working on it at that point. Anyway, we had to do it all in the morning because once 10 o'clock came, I just couldn't talk. I was dribbling. So it was quite a, <laughs> it was quite a horrific. And that Bell's palsy stayed with me I think for about six months thereafter. But uh, when I look back at the, the footage of that little show, there I am running – taking this guy around town through, you know, Thai town. It was the – and then we ended up filming um, on site at um, the launch of the Sydney Festival at Customs House, and that was 2002, so it was for the 2003 festival. Um, and then there's just photos of me with a dripping face. Horrid, horrid. Wow, well, some interesting <laughs> memories there, Sava. So, um, yeah, it, amazing. So, obviously, you've been in the game for a long time and catering and events have 
huge ups and downs. I suppose they follow the fortunes of society. Like, tell us what the vibe is at the moment, these interesting times that we're in. Well, the vibe is has always been there, that 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 sort of want and a need for a celebration and a connection and a party, um, whether it be, you know, th- private individuals or, or businesses trying to, like, get across a me- message. It's always been there. People, people are very keen to celebrate, to party and to connect. And um, I feel like the, the basic elements are always there, food, drink, guests and music. It's just the way that people scale them up and down. Um, depending on their level of investment. But even during like the last two years since March 2020 or February 2020 when all this, when did it, when did it kind of March? Well, March was, March we went into the first lockdown, but um, Feb things are definitely, there's a lot of cancellations. Yeah, people have always been tried. They were always trying to work out ways to do things. So the the want and the need to do was always there. The limitations were always there, and so people will, have always been trying to okay, how do we work around this? How do we do this? We send. We still want to connect with people. We'll send food in boxes. We'll send hampers. We'll you know do mini parties and zooms and all that sort of stuff. So there's always been a want and a need for it, and it's. We've been really lucky, I think, like, what is it, 27 years I've been doing this? You can cut me in half and count the rings to see how many, how many years I've been running about. But I I am often astounded about how generous and people uh, people are and hopeful people are when it comes to their parties. And they, they just want to show people a good time and, and, and be kind and, you know, feed them and water them. So it's a good feeling. Mm. What kind of trends are you seeing in terms of the f- the style of food or particular dishes or the format of events at the moment? Um, what's really huge at the moment are cocktails, and they have been for the last couple of years, but I'm really noticing a shift from the beverage department, in the beverage department from sort of wines, you know, the sparkling red and white wine, blah, um, into like bespoke cocktailing, pre-bottled cocktailing, um, and great glasses. There's a whole range of glasses now available to us never before. So that's that's the drink thing sort of exploding and happening. In food, look, it's always – it's changing. The size of the food is changing and what it is is also changing. So it's pretty much um, – and, and especially with the onset of Instagram, so Instagram and social media, whatever is trending there is happening – um, to be specific, um, like I can't tell you because we just we're changing. Like we, we had nine events this week, and there were nine very different menus that we produce next week. Is thirteen, and again the same. Um, the dinners have come back. Actually, isn't that interesting? The dinners have come back um, in a major way. So people are are, are enjoying that sit down stuff, but. Specifically, I can't tell you because it's just so we're really lucky because our clients are so varied and their wants are so varied um, that we're kind of dipping in and out of stuff all the time. It's it's we're kind of in a really lucky situation that we we don't stick to packages um, and that we're forced. Like for instance, I had to do something that was galactic. I had to create, you know, an eight piece canapé galactic menu with a whole bunch of colours that Mother Nature doesn't produce. Um, so that was a bit tricky, but we got there. Oh, I love that brief. How cool. <laughs> yeah, and then you kind of sent a whole bunch of blues and greys and and then these kind of lilacs and, you know, you know, Pantone colours, that colours of the year, and you think, great, Mother Nature, where are you on this? So um, not a lot of green and reds in there, but we got there. We got there. I love that. Um, I love the stories that caterers have, and one of my favourites is Peter Rowland talking about mixing souffles in a cement mixer in some paddock next to Flemington back in the day. Um, uh, you know, we've already talked about <laughs> me being ballast for a truck trying to get up a hill. <laughs> what other kind of close calls All have right. you had? Okay, so I'm going to give you one that is this is like a very long time ago, and I was like, I wasn't my catering company, and I was a very, I was a very wee thing like very wee, probably just was allowed to be working. Um, the Prince and Princess of Wales, so Charles and Diana came to Australia and we produced, um, the company that I was working for produced a gazpacho, a, like a no, chilled cucumber soup, that's right. And th- there was something like maybe five or 600 people at this lunch thing. And so we made this um, gazpacho 
no, it was chilled cucumber. It was chilled cucumber. And we traveled to the job in very clean garbage bins. So when we got to the job, there were like six or seven of those, you know, green bins with the black lids on top that were clipped that were wrapped in an enormous amount of clad wrap. We weren't conscious of plastic back then. Um, and then we, we took the buckets off, we took the lids off and then just started ladling and serving this soup out of that. Um, yeah, that's kind of been the one that comes to mind. That is and not very royal. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, it's like it's like the magic of Disney. We never see – the beauty is we never see Mickey with his – with his head off. We never see the character with his head off. He's always Mickey. So once the curtain's up, the curtain's up and whatever happens behind the, you know, behind the scenes, as long as it's hygienic and above board, anything goes, Danny, anything goes. That's so interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, the trend in restaurants has been towards open kitchens and just sort of displaying that work. But I feel like in catering, it still is, you know, people want to see the finished product. They don't want to, they don't want to see the sausage being made. It's, um, Catering chefs and, and restaurant chefs is a very two different skill sets. Um, if you speak to um, if you speak to any chef that's gone from a restaurant to catering, it's a huge adjustment. It's like it's cultural. It's like learning another language. In a restaurant, um, the expectation to produce a la minute food um, is very very high because you just literally go preparation, fridge, add a fridge finish off the dish, serve it up, and it just goes straight. For us, however, we have to construct menus um, that you can prep X amount of days, X amount of hours in advance. It, then they need to be chilled down and stored hygienically. They need, then need to travel to then get to the other end to then have heat applied to it, if not, then assembled, then plated up and then sent out. And sometimes you could be in a paddock or a warehouse or stuff like that. So we, we there, there are much more elements involved in a catering in an on-site catering menu you know the challenges are always there and the end result is as long as you know the client doesn't know what happened on the journey boom <laughs> <laughs> is that what you love about it like what do you love about what you do you know I, I, I um god I love so much about it even though I'm I'm kind of really you know in the thick of it right now being you know at the end of November uh what I love about it most is the people, um, other people, and that's people on, on the people that support me and the people that we work for and create stuff. They just give me so much and, um, and, and their visions and, and, and what they want um, is quite inspiring and you, and you want to be there for them um, and you want to deliver for them and you want the people that they're entertaining to be hugely happy. And so then when you get the guests – I mean, I have people talking, telling, talking to me about menus that we produced, God, a basquillion years ago, and they're coming back. I remember that lamb cutlet that you used to did in blood. I'm just like, we don't do them anymore because they're so expensive. Um, but, um, and it's like, wow, you really, that sort of stuff touches people, and that's, that's kind of why I'm here. Um, if it wasn't for the people, I don't think I'd be around. Mm. It's interesting because, you know, when you ask chefs and restaurateurs what they love, it is a lot, often they'll talk about being facilitating people's special moments, those, being there for those occasions. But it's sort of like just about every event that you do is, is that occasion. It has that, that weight. It's, it's those memories in creation. Yeah, it, it is. Well, it's the weight beforehand that falls on us because, you know, you communicate, yep, to the client, yep, yep, we're a yes, everything's got to be a yes. And then you kind of put the phone down, I'll send the email and you just, can I swear on your podcast? Like, if you say K, like, how, how are we going to deliver? And then you've got to somehow translate it or, or kind of fashion it to then take it to the, you know, and I have, I really do, I'm so blessed. I have a wonderful team of uh, chefs that work with me um, who really, um, who have developed the DNA of, of what we do together and it's just I mean, we can just look at each other and go, "Yep, that works. That doesn't work." It's it's kind of a it's a wordless communication. So it it's there's a lot there's a lot that goes into it. There's actually a lot. There's more than a lot. There's like I didn't go to bed till one o'clock last night because I had to unpick something in terms of ideas. And this morning I was up at five thirty testing it out before everyone got into the kitchen, um, so I could prove it worked. You with you, you don't stay in business as long as I have without kind of putting in the hard yards. I think that's um, 
um, I think that's kind of fair to say. But as you can hear, you can hear my voice. I'm just absolutely exhausted. Um, Savit, so tell us, give us the backstory. Like, what drew you into this work? Look, <clears throat> I originally was studying. Um, art at, at, at a college and then I was like, you know what, this is not for me. I'm it's actually studies, not for me. And even though I loved art history and I still do and I'm, um, and I'm really into, you know, what's coming out of contemporary s- scenes around the world, I mean, in terms of art, it just, I just couldn't study it. It, it, it had to be something that I had experienced. So then I travelled um, and I went and lived where did I go? Oh, that's right. I lived with my grandparents um, in Cyprus in their village. And I thought, oh, I need some more money, so I better get a job that pays. Um, I stumbled across a hotel um, in the tourist area. Um, my grandparents have lived in Cyprus, both dead, but that's where I, I, I went. And I found this hotel paid really, really well. And the only job available there was in a little the taverna on the, by the pool. So I crapped on a bit that I could cook, nothing. The woman who was running the kitchen knew that I was lying. And um, she, and later she just, I, my first day she looked at me and she said, look, I know you can't cook. And I was like, crap. And I said, well, why did you employ me? She said, oh, because I, I was the age group where um, the boys went to do military service and her son was in military service. And she said, look, I don't have my son right now. So, you know, here it is. Um, I was her son for that time. And so I kind of got away with a fair bit, but I was also taught quite a lot. Um, so I went and we, I did that sort of summer, made a bucket of coin, which gave me, which gave me the ability to travel right through, um, Greece and Italy, um, of that year, came back home and I was like, you know what? I love this. So then I started working for a company called Just New Catering with um, the legendary Norma Willis. Um, people will remember her. She was quite a scary little thing. She produced the most gorgeous food, most beautiful food, but she looked like a brickies labourer in a little jerk and um, jerk uh, little vest and stuff. And we, I just, I really did learn from there. Um, and, and I did a lot of a lot of work there. I then um, somebody then asked me to do something something for a fashion house, and I was like, oh god, like I can't do this on my own. And I got pushed and shoved. And the next thing you know, I had um, a full diary for a, a single person operating a single operator operating out of my little bachelor pad uh, kitchenette. And then then here I am now. That's amazing. How many employees do you have? How many are sort of on your books? So, God, I keep a I keep a full time team of I keep the team really really um, lean. Um, so there's six because and then we just have a bunch of loyal um, casuals that come and go. Um, but you know the interesting thing, and this is kind of testament to what we've done over the the, the years and, and and where I am and. Just who we are, like who we are internally. During the whole COVID thing, they were made redundant. They all came back on when the work came back on, which was great. Like every single one of them. Then I stood them down three times because of the work just stops, and it's like I, you know, I can't operate. And they're still there, and and I'm really lucky. So that we didn't go through much change um, during COVID, but. Um, I mean, now we're doing now we're doing some really fascinating stuff. In that, we've moved, we've added another section to our business, like a, a production. So, we've um, I've started a podcast called Plated Three Food Memories because after twenty five years of talking to people about food, we um, I've collected all this data and information about stuff, and. I thought, you know what, I'm going to start. Well, somebody asked me, would you do a podcast? I was like, okay, what will you do it on? I was like, mm, maybe I could do it on people's food memories. So we've developed this podcast into our third series. Um, but now we're doing live recorded events, and which we did with your good mate, Alice. Yes. Well, Alice Saslavsky, a really good friend of Dirty Linen and a great personal friend of mine. And I, yeah, I look forward to listening to you two having a chin wag because I'm sure it'll be very upbeat and, um, yeah, really interesting. What, what is it about, about food that you think makes for such good stories? Think about it. 
think about like just think about what food is to us and everyone has an experience with food whether they're into food or not everyone has a connection to it and if you strike the right chord the smell the memory um experience it takes you immediately back to a memory and the most fascinating things is ever like so what if I interviewed interviewed about 35 people now um everybody's menu a memory at least one is on a mother on a grandmother and on a travel story so um and there's there's the occasional grandfather and father but really travel and and the maternal links to your life come up, I just think it's nostalgia. And I think it's a really beautiful thing because what I'm finding is it's when we start to tell the stories, we realise very, very quickly that everybody is the same and that we've all had similar experiences and it's, and, and it's in those experience and the discussion of and the openness without being without being oversharing, that, that connects us and actually makes us feel good and it connects us to the human race, to the human condition. And we realise, hey, you know what? We're not the only people here. And I think therein lies the secret to um, making this world a better place, which is kind of my big trip right now. I love that. And it, you, you actually make me remember a recent guest on this podcast, um, Sean Christie David, who spoke about, you know, social enterprise he's doing in Sydney called Afghan Social, where he's employing Afghan women, recently arrived refugees, and they're cooking their food. And, and it's this sort of, I guess, a community outreach project as well. And one thing that Sean said that really stayed with me was people aren't racist around food. And I think you can apply that, you know, people aren't homophobic around food, people aren't sexist around food, people are more open-minded around food because, as you so well said, it is about finding those points of commonality and connection. Um, it's, it, it, it is, and it's, that, oh, it's, it's quite a magical space, but in order... In order to get those stories out of people, you, you, me as I, me as the host, I've got to connect with them, and I've got to find a way, and I've got to find a, a spot where I can get that story because everybody wants to tell it. They just don't know what story they want to tell, right? So at the end of everyone's interview, they're just kind of flying their arms in the air, you know, wow, this is amazing. And then as soon as I hang up on them, or I just turn the mic off. I collapse. I'm exhausted because you want to do it in, you can see the story, but you've got to find the kindest way to get it out of them because that very, that's, you're kind of looking how to amplify that happiness. And then once you get it out and you get it out in the right way, then your audience and people listening, they just connect and they finish that experience, whether it be a live record, an audience or um, or listening to a podcast, and they feel really good. They feel really good about themselves and, more importantly, they feel really good about where they came from and then that carries them to the next bit um, and you just – hope that you can keep doing it from guest to guest. Yeah. Well, it's really, yeah, you're sort of describing a kind of transference, which I'm going to keep pondering. It's really interesting. But Savi, you mentioned, you know, it's part of a project to make the world a better place. Like what's, tell, give us a bit more on that. I, so um, I am a, I'm, I'm, I'm a single dad of twins, uh, 17, almost eight year old sons. Um, I'm very lucky because I have a village of people who help me, um, get through that parenting bit but I look at them and I look at their future and I remember when they were sort of first out of the box um, I saw an interview with Joanna Lumley and she was asked are you hopeful for the future now I've never thought about the future Um, I had thought about the future until that point and then I looked at these two little I call them flatmates because I've got them for life and I looked at my flatmates and I was like yeah, your future. What, like, what are we going to do? And then Joanna says in her interview, her response to the question was, I am hopeful because there's no other option. I just, I just want to bring the hope back. And it's the hope that's going to get us through. It's that hope that's going to equalize us. It's the, we're, we're, we're all human. We're all doing the same thing. You know, whether we live here, whether we live there, whether we have the same amount of money, we have earned this amount of money or that amount of money. Um, as long as we can get that and there's that through that, through that hope, there's awareness and there's understanding and then prejudices just disappear. So, and that's what I'm, that's actually what I'm finding with the podcast, but it takes a lot of work. 
a lot of lot of me. And what I love most about it, though, is the amount of work that I. It's the same amount of work that I put into an event, in terms of, you know, curating the food with our chefs, with the client, and then you know, and then curating the service and the beverages bar. The interesting thing is with that that the end result happiness that comes out of that just gets a few people. I put that same energy into a show, into a, a podcast record, and I can reach like a thousand million times more people if the reach is right. You know what I mean? So I, I just want to shift my mem- um, my energy so I'm making more people happy and making more people think. I think that's the only way that I can um, – that's my contribution. Let's see if I can do it. Mm, I love that. Well, I'm, I'm sure you will. Uh, so from the quite profound, I want to get to something that's, I guess, quite concrete. And that you mentioned earlier, wrapping those bins in layers and layers of plastic. And obviously, in all sectors of society, we've been mu- become much more conscious of waste. And wa- waste in catering and events is such a, such a big issue. Can you tell me sort of what you've seen over the years change and what specific things you're doing or can see coming around the corner? Yeah, well, okay, you've got, I'm, I get quite passionate about this sort of stuff. Um, so I'm going to be very careful with the language that I choose because it's going down on record. Look, like um, Ale- Alexandra Elliott Harry said in, in one of your recent um, interviews, we all can't be completely con- uh, 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 completely green, you know, that, but there are steps that we can take. For me, there are two things that stick out um, that are huge bugbears um, on events. And the first one is the service of mineral water in small bottles. So just think about it. If you're at an event for a 1,000 people and you're serving mineral water in small bottles with straws, do you know how much landfill that creates? <laughs> And that is just an enormous thing. And I, we just we keep training people to look at what rubbish we're leaving behind from our service. So whatever we can do, wherever we can minimise um, our impact, our garbage impact, it, it's it's working. And I ha- and I and I know that it's working because our garbage fees that we charge or collection fees that we charge clients over the last well, let's take two years before um, COVID has reduced quite significantly. Uh, which is which is a really wonderful thing, but that is that's kind of a conscious thing, and that comes into play when you're designing an event in terms of the food um in terms of the beverage service, in terms of a whole bunch of other elements that go into it you know i mean I, I've noticed florists these days when they're doing huge installations instead of getting a whole bunch of fresh green stuff, they're actually fluffing it out or filling it out with plastic um, uh, p- plastic flowers that they can reuse on other events. So there's, there's a whole lot of stuff around that that um, happens. Um, another thing, that another big bugbear of mine is that bloody grazing table um, and stop me because I could go on about it forever. Uh, so this is this is sl- whole- Please go for it. Yeah. <laughs> so this is whole- let's have a grazing table. I just want to preface this by saying I am. We are the worst grazing table service providers ever because we put no effort into them, um, because we just don't believe in them. I mean, I think it's just. First of all, I think it's lazy. I'm um, just putting a whole bunch of food on a table for people to go to, and but nine times out of ten, you've got to put four to five times the amount of food that you rec- that guests will eat just to make it look full. And what happens with that food after like three or four, five, six hours? What do you think happens with it? We throw it's, it out. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. And it's just, and all for those initial first photos. And I just think, what, well, that's completely wrong. Um, and, and, and a huge waste. And not necessarily saving a whole bunch of money. I think I just had to do a cost comparison between a beautiful cocktail party where we reign supreme um, and, a, and a grazing table just to show them the comparison of cost. And it was like, 40, 35 to 40% more simply because of the volume of food we had to put on there. So anything that – and that's the beauty about catering too because you, you, you can cater right to the number of guests there. So managing waste is, is very, very, is very, very good. Um, but I the, that grazing table, everybody, please stop it. It's you've, We've done it. We've seen it. You know, like – I love it. Um and I also just want to put on the record that I hate butterboards. 
Can they just but can they just be dead? <laughs> Um, I, I just I, look, you know, there's trends and there's fads and things like that, and and I guess the thing is, people see them and they're inspired by them. But when, sure, if you're doing that at home for like five to ten people, which a lot of the times these these social media posts are designed for, but when you're translating them into large numbers, they kind of they garble. They don't make any sense. Um, but try telling that to someone who is, you know, headstrong on wanting to do something that they've seen that they've fallen in love with that's the other thing with catering you really like that's the beauty about going to a restaurant and and what i love more so these days at a restaurant it's pretty much the chef is deciding what journey you're going on and you go there knowing that you're going to go on that journey a lot of the times you, you know you get a catering client who thinks okay i've been watching master chef for so many years my kitchen rules blah 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 i know everything and you kind of have to manage that expectation and very kindly and hopefully <laughs> that you you're still friends by the end of it but i think i've got a few friends i'm sure you do sava it's so good to catch up with you again an absolute pleasure to hear your stories feel your good vibes thank you so much for sharing with us today on dirty linen my pleasure thanks so much This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.